Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for inv inviting me to discuss some of the work we do on some different approaches for risk assessment. And I think it will not be a lot about packaging, but uh, I think, uh, I hope I will be able to convince you that this methodology may be very valuable to address some of the concern we have discussed uh, up to now. Uh, there are actually several reasons why we would like to revisit uh, risk assessment, and I will focus only on one such reason today. It doesn't work very well. So yes, and actually to illustrate this reason, I will just take that example. I think it's a raw material that you all know, uh, I am sure. It's a famous uh, potato. And if you actually analyze chemically a potato, you will, have a lo you will find a lot of chemicals. And I think uh, you have some of these chemicals listed here, and uh, like amino acids, like uh, micronutrients, like uh, different things which are actually do have beneficial effect on nutrition, and it's why we are eating potatoes. But um, <coughs> you have other chemicals if you look very carefully, and they are inherently occurring in the potato, and some of them are quite good. Other others, you, we don't really know what they may do on health, and some of them are really not so good. And I would take the example of shaconin, so the glycoalkaloids, shaconin uh, uh, and uh, solanin, which uh, have caused actually uh, deaths in the human being of people consuming green potatoes. So just to say that it's uh, quite complex chemistry. And then, you know, if you look at the protease inhibitors, this will inhibit digestion of protein. And how we do we deal with that? We actually cook potato or we process them. But if you process, and for instance, uh, if you do French fries, you will have actually the production of new chemicals. And some of these chemicals, I will take an example up there, the, up there, the methyl uh, butanol, you will uh, see that it's a flavor. It's why we like actually French fries. But there are some others which are much less uh, nice to hear about, like acrylamide, which is a Maillard reaction product. If you have asparagine, which is an amino acid and glucose, and you heat up, you get, uh, you get acrylamide, which is a genotoxic carcinogen. Then you have uh, many others. You have all the one which I would say can be defined as di indirect additives, in a way. <laughs> You have uh, all the residue from agricultural uh, practices. You have all the chemicals migrating from the packaging. And you have uh, many others. And then you have all kind of environmental contaminants. Some of them are naturally uh, occurring. Some others are just uh, pollutants. And so on. And you have actually many, many things. And what I wanted to, to just uh, summarize wi with this uh, potato story is just the fact that uh, you have a lot of chemicals in food. And actually, food is chemicals. Food is a mixture of chemicals. And I think we need to keep in mind that. And there are many of these chemicals. And something which is quite inter not interesting, but uh, important to understand is that for most of the chemical uh, you find in food, you will have no toxicological data. Meaning that if you need to do a risk assessment, you just cannot. And uh, sometimes it's very useful to do a risk assessment. You know, for the, the packaging chemicals, you have seen that there are many uh, packaging chemicals which may actually occur in food. So what to do in such a situation? For me, it's clear that this will not be through a classical approach where you test all the chemicals because it's just not feasible and in many cases not uh, necessary. And probably the solution is in the in silico approach. So what is in silico approach? It's an approach which is based on the fact that the toxicity is actually determined by structure. And this is a very old um, uh, principle, meaning that if you understand the structure activity relationship, you will be able to predict. And we are not obviously the only one who are uh, thinking about that. And this has been used a lot in the pharmaceutical industry. And now this is coming more and more in the food uh, and chemical uh, sector. 
Now, if you compare with pharma, actually, in the food context, you need, if you need to, if you have um, um, prediction, <laughs> a predicted toxicity, you need to satisfy a number of criteria which are a bit different than the one you would have for pharma. And I will not go through all of them, but I think uh, I will go through the most important one. The first one, which is the most important, is relevance. You need to predict something which is relevant for risk assessment. And what is the most relevant for risk assessment? It will be, for instance, chronic toxicity. It will be carcinogenic potency, these type of things. And secondly, something which is important in the food sector is to have a quantitative uh, prediction. So to know that the chemical has a high probability to be neurotoxic, for instance, you cannot do much with it. Uh, what is important to have is to have a value that you can use and that you can compare to exposure, because in the end, it's really the combination of exposure and toxicology which actually uh, allow to make uh, sound decision. And this can be done through the margin of exposure. And I will go through a little bit more <coughs> on the margin of exposure, because I think it's a key uh, concept to be able to use computational toxicology and in silico toxicology. So classically, and I think we saw that maybe a little bit in the first uh, presentation, uh, hazard characterization is done uh, like that. So you actually establish a safe level of exposure in human, like the acceptable daily intake, which is the ratio between a safe level in animals, very often, divided by uh, uh, some uncertainty factors, which will deal with some of the uncer classical uncertainties like interspecies, inter-individual uh, differences. This is the very classical things. And if you have an exposure which is lower than the ADI, so a margin of safety which is higher than one, the margin of safety is here, you will have uh, relatively uh, low concern and low priority for further testing. Now, if you don't have uh, any, uh, any safe level of exposure in human, how can you do that? So basically, you do a margin of exposure here. You take the tox value, the toxicological value that you have, you divide that by the exposure, and then you have this margin of exposure, and the level of concern will depend upon the size of this margin of exposure. <laughs> and uh, higher it is, lower is the concern, and this margin should at least cover the classical uncertainties. So you know that this margin of exposure can be very useful to use predicted value, because actually this tox value can be predicted. So meaning it's a way to exploit uh, computational toxicology. So now we know basically what we want. We know how we can interpret the data. So now what kind of tools do we have to predict the relevant toxicological value, value uh, for risk assessment? So the first approach I would like to present is the QSCR, so the uh, quantitative uh, structure activity relationship. The principle is to find a relationship uh, between the chemical structure of compounds and a given property. So for instance, you have here lowest observed adverse effect level, so it's a tox value, toxicological value. Uh, in that case, it, it is in the rat, so it's chronic toxicity, and then for different compounds. And then you have the structure of this different compound. You can actually describe this structure <coughs> with, um, <coughs> with many descriptors. And the model is actually select <coughs> the most relevant descriptors, combine them, so in the end, uh, allow to actually predict the toxicity. So you have an example here that we have published uh, quite long time ago. It concerns actually chronic toxicity in the rat. You can see here a validation, leave one out, cross validation, where you see that you have a very good correlation between experimental uh, data and predicted data. Something I would like to point out is the fact that there are many more actually low L in the database than chemicals. You have 400 chemicals, that's 500 almost. 
low L, which means that some of these chemicals have been tested more than once. It means that this gives an opportunity to have an insight on the viability of, uh, of the experimental data, because obviously you cannot have a model which would be better than uh, the experimental uh, data. And what you see here is that the average experimental viability is about four. And uh, if you look at the average model error is about five, meaning that you don't have a very big difference between uh, the two. And we have done that with other, uh, other endpoints. I will not go, go through all of them. Maybe a recent one that we published, which is the TD50. It's a carcinogenic potency, which is a very important um, uh, parameters to predict. And you can see that as for the low L, you get actually a prediction of this value, which is really very close to what you would get uh, in terms of um, experimental data, and that the viability <coughs> of experimental data is quite high. It's, uh, it's at least a factor of four. So if you repeat experiment with the same animal and the same compound and same uh, protocol. So just an example on how this could be actually uh, used. And this is an example that we went through in a ILSI uh, Europe uh, expert group. But it's based on, on a real one. It's, I think you may know it. It's uh, isopropyl thioxanthone, so ITX. It's a photo initiator, so it's coming from uh, UV cure inks. And it was detected in milk bricks at level which were actually quite high, 70 to 600 ppb. And you can calculate the exposure. So the exposure are here, and this is the extreme. And the only tox data known uh, was uh, about the genotoxicity. It was not genotoxic. And then you need to decide very quickly whether you need to take action or whether you can delay the action. And uh, one way to have an insight on the health significance is actually to use this uh, predicted value. So you have different models which have been used. I will just focus on, on the rat. Uh, low L, uh, because I don't have so much uh, time, but you get the predicted value for ITX, which is about 50 micro, uh, milligram per kilogram body weight per day. It's a chronic one. And if you calculate margin of exposure, so you divide this, the, the chronic uh, low L, you divide by the exposure, you get this type of uh, margin of um, exposure. Now you try to interpret that. So as I said before, you need here to convert actually a low L into a no effect level, and you need a factor between 3 and 10, uh, let's say 10. And then you have the classical one, the interspecies differences and inter, uh, individual uh, differences. In that case, you should have a margin which is higher than 1,000. And we could see that in the, ex the highest exposure, we were lower, which actually triggered the um, uh, action. Now, something in this context uh, which is interesting is that the fact that after this uh, story occurred, there was some tox data published, and it was a 28-day study with a low L of 50 milligram per kilo. So in that case, you would expect to be confident to have a margin of exposure of uh, about 6,000. It's bigger because the duration of the study is uh, shorter. So you have an additional factor of six. And you see that, again, with high exposure level, you have also a margin of exposure which is a bit low, which would actually trigger the same type of uh, conclusion and the same type of decision. Meaning with both the computa computational um, approach and the experimental approach here, you would get very similar conclusion. This one took uh, about a year, while this one would took half an hour, which means that you can have, uh, basically you can speed up uh, quite quickly uh, the understanding on the health concern. Now a second uh, approach, which is a lot discussed right now, it's what is called read across. It's based on the fact that an unknown activity of a compound can be actually extrapolated <coughs> 
from activities of a similar compound. And if you look at uh, ITX again, I think it uh, showed that first you need to have uh, an analog, and you have different analogs, but you have to find an analog which is populated with toxicological data which <coughs> are relevant, which was actually not the case for the, uh, for the ITX. Read across is a lot about similarity and how you actually establish the similarity. And for a long time, it has been based on chemical structure. But now we see that uh, chemical structure is probably not enough. And it would be much better to add additional parameters. For instance, metabolism and mechanism of action. And uh, what is interesting is the fact that these two uh, parameters can be also predicted. And I will give you a short example on the mechanism of action. And it's about uh, actually using, oh, what did I do? Uh, it's something uh, which is about docking. And docking is actually to be able to predict ligand receptor interaction. And uh, the example is here is about uh, chemicals uh, like uh, of the family of zeralenol. So zeralenol is a, a mycotoxin. It's produced by fungi, which occur uh, in food. You have zeralenol here up there, it doesn't work very well, this stuff, but it's the one on the, the left above. And you can see that they are very similar structure, metabolites, and these metabolites, they actually, uh, they have activities which are of different uh, potency, and you have this one, for instance, which is not active at all. So you can see that you have similar structure, but <laughs> it's not so easy to predict what will be the activity. By the way, so the key event for uh, the alenol molecule is actually interaction with the estrogen receptor. And uh, we were wondering whether we could actually predict this interaction with the estrogen receptors. And for instance, use this prediction to actually do read across for other chemicals of the same family for which no data uh, is available and which are not commercially available that we cannot test uh, very easily. So what we did, I think this computer is against me. OK. <coughs> so basically, what you see here is that uh, there are data on bioassays where you can see that you can actually rank uh, some of these molecules and you can uh, by, by uh, potency. What is interesting is that you have a very similar ranking between binding uh, to the receptor in test tube, bioassays, and also with the limited data we have uh, in vivo, meaning that this interaction with the receptor is actually very important to predict the toxicity. And if you can predict that, you have a good insight on the toxicity. So since we have this ranking, we try to actually reflect that. I mean, we try. It has been done, actually, with uh, a collaboration with the University of Parma. Try to actually see whether you could rank with uh, docking this molecule. And actually, you can perfectly rank this molecule. And you, you actually have a very good insight on the binding with these uh, things, which means that this demonstrates that this docking uh, approach is feasible for this class of chemicals. And then we can actually test the other one which have not been tested. Something else we can do is uh, reflected here is that you can with this, if you analyze actually the interaction with the receptor, you can see that uh, there are structural alert for the high potency of the oestrogenicity, for instance, to have a hydroxyl in this position 14 and 15, you would actually significantly increase uh, the oestrogenicity. If you have hydroxylation of 16 or 13, for instance, you would actually decrease. So in the end, you can probably have a good insight uh, to select the best analogs to do read across. So uh, the summary for in silico method is the following. that. Uh, First, you need the structure. That's very important. You need many, actually, tools. 
and as many you have, uh, it the be is the best. You need some quantitative value, and uh, you need to use models which are actually validated, and something which is important is actually to integrate them. And this issue of integration was actually addressed by an expert group uh, uh, at ILSI Europe, and you can see that uh, this expert group designed a decision tree which is actually reflecting the classical risk assessment. Uh, it starts with exposure, this is the same uh, as usual. And then you have a, r a hazard identification uh, step where you collect all the data you have, so basically analogs, tox data on analogs, prediction, if you have uh, genotoxicity, you will predict the TD50, <coughs> otherwise you will predict the chronic toxicity. Then you have a hazard characterization step, which means that you review all the data as compared to the problem formulation, the problem you need to, to, uh, to address, and you can select actually the best, um, the best value to do the risk characterization through the margin uh, of exposure. And uh, within this ILC group, we actually assess or analyze the uncertainties. And what was found also with the uh, case study <laughs> is that the application of this decision tree bring uh, uncertainties which are not very different than the classical risk assessment. For instance, a big, ex uh, big uh, uncertainty uh, in risk assessment is actually exposure assessment. So in that case, it would be the same. And then the hazard assessment, the, the basic uncertainties like the animal-human extrapolation, like uh, whether uh, what we are addressing in tox studies are actually relevant for human and whether the mechanism of action at high doses are relevant for low doses, all this is the same. So it's basically, unfortunately, not better than uh, the risk assessment, but it's very similar. Then uh, we thought that relying on predicted tox value will introduce some more uncertainties, but they are not so big, actually. Uh, we could see that with the QSAR. And there are good paper on read across which show that uh, actually the they are quite predictive. And something which is very important, maybe you don't predict very well with these methodologies, but uh, it seems that uh, you, if you apply that, you will actually get a degree of conservatism which is very similar than what you have when you apply a classical risk assessment. And uh, the fact that you can uh, use many more data than in the classical risk assessment with the read across, for instance, you have different approaches which are independent, sometimes different models with in independent uh, database make the whole uh, assessment quite conservative if you know what kind of default assumption and conservative assumption to be applied. So now I think uh, I would like to get back to this meeting and say, is it useful for packaging safety? And I just give you a, a very short insight on that. I think it's very useful. And it's something we are developing uh, if you have a packaging material, we start with migration study, and then uh, with the migrate, we are submitted uh, to different bioanalytical, uh, different analytical tools. Uh, first, the chemical profiling, and you get this type of chromatogram where you have uh, sometimes uh, quite a number of peaks, and these peaks are reflecting chemicals. And you know that if you can identify this chemical, then uh, you can assess them. You can assess them basically with classical data if they are available. And if they are not available, you can use the, uh, <coughs> the computational toxicology to see whether they are of concern, whether you need to invest on that, or whether you better use your resources to do something else. So that's the first area where the Comtox can actually uh, be used. Another one which is a bit more tricky is the fact that we are doing also biodetection. Uh, we are actually um, applying biotest, bioassays with the migrate. And if you have an activity, for instance, oestrogenic activity in this biotest, then you can try to figure out 
in your list of chemicals identified using in silico toxicology which chemicals is actually responsible for these activities. Uh, and then you can actually assess it or manage it. Uh, because uh, uh, when you have the level of concern, then you can actually manage the concern. Either you don't use this packaging or you just request additional data uh, on, uh, on, on toxicology to just uh, ensure that uh, you can back up the safety. So just in conclusion, so I think uh, hazard characterization can be conducted uh, based on predictive uh, models and predictive approach. It's the best is to have several independent models which should be applied uh, in an integrated way and the models should be properly validated. As I said, if it's properly, this approach is properly applied, it's likely that uh, it will bring reasonable, a reasonable degree of conservatism. And uh, I think uh, this tool is likely to be a valuable tool following decision while ensuring uh, has uh, protection. I think it can play a significant role in safety assessment of packaging chemicals and packaging material. And uh, I think it's something we would like to do is uh, this should be used to address the concern of large number of chemicals uh, to have an idea on all these non-tested chemicals, whether <laughs> it's really a concern or not. So with this, I would like to thank uh, a lot of people who collaborated on, on all this, uh, uh, the EC Europe expert group, people at the University of Parma, and uh, people uh, at Nestle, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there is any question. Hello.